Story one. I've been a nurse for over a decade now, working in various hospitals across California. You'd think after all this time, I'd have seen it all, but there are some experiences that stick with you that make you question everything you thought you knew about life and death. This is one of those stories. It all started about three years ago when I was working the night shift in the med surg unit at Pinewood Memorial Hospital. It was a quiet night, as most of them were. The kind of night where the only sounds are the steady beeping of monitors and the occasional squeak of shoes on linoleum. Around 2 a.m., the call light for room 302 lit up. The patient was an elderly man, Mr. Johnson, who had been admitted for pneumonia. When I entered the room, I found him sitting up in bed, his eyes wide with fear. There's something under the bed, he whispered, his voice shaking. I can hear it moving. I checked under the bed, of course. Nothing there but dust bunnies and a lost slipper. I reassured Mr. Johnson, chalking it up to medication side effects or maybe just the disorientation that often comes with being in the hospital. But he kept insisting. All night long, that call light kept flashing. Each time, the same story. Something under the bed. Something moving. Scratching. Whispering. By morning, I was exhausted and more than a little freaked out. The next day, Mr. Johnson was discharged and a new patient was admitted to room 302. Mrs. Rodriguez, a sweet lady in her 70s, there for observation after a fall. I didn't think much of it until my shift that night when her call light started flashing. When I entered the room, Mrs. Rodriguez was sitting up, just like Mr. Johnson had been. Her eyes were fixed on the space beneath her bed. Nurse, she said, her voice barely above a whisper. I think there's an animal under the bed. I can hear it scratching. A chill ran down my spine. I checked under the bed again, more thoroughly this time. Nothing. I even got maintenance to come take a look. They found no signs of pests or anything that could be making noise. Mrs. Rodriguez calmed down eventually, but I could tell she was still uneasy. I tried to brush it off as a coincidence, but a nagging feeling stayed with me for the rest of the shift. The next night, room 302 had a new occupant, Jake, a 23-year-old recovering from appendix surgery. Young, strong, clear-headed, not the type you'd expect to be spooked by imagination or medication. Around midnight, Jake's call light went off. When I got to the room, I found him huddled in the corner, as far from the bed as he could get. He was shaking, tears streaming down his face. Please, he begged, you have to get me out of here. There's something in this room, under the bed. I can hear it, whispering. That was it for me. We moved Jake to another room immediately. I spent the rest of the night poring over the history of room 302, looking for any clues but there was nothing unusual in the records. Just a standard hospital room with a revolving door of patients. Over the next few weeks, we had five more incidents in room 302. Different patients, different ages, different conditions, all with the same story. Something under the bed, scratching, moving, whispering. Management started to take notice. They brought in pest control, had the room deep cleaned, even had a priest come in to bless it, Quietly, of course. Can't have rumors of a haunted hospital room getting out. Nothing changed. Then came the night that changed everything. I was working a double shift, covering for a sick colleague. It was hour 16 of what would be a 24-hour marathon when the call light for 302 lit up again. The patient was a middle-aged woman named Sarah, there for routine tests. As I approached the room, I could hear Sarah's voice. She wasn't calling for help. She was talking to someone, laughing even. I paused outside the door, listening. Oh, you poor thing, I heard her say. How long have you been trapped here? I burst into the room, expecting to find another nurse, or maybe a visitor. But Sarah was alone, sitting on the edge of her bed, looking down at the floor. She looked up at me and smiled. Oh, hello, nurse. I was just talking to the little girl under the bed. She's been so lonely. I felt the blood drain from my face. What little girl? I asked, my voice barely a whisper. Sarah's smile faded, replaced by a look of concern. You mean you can't see her? She's right there, under the bed. She says she's been trying to talk to people for so long, but everyone just gets scared and runs away. I don't know what made me do it, but I got down on my knees and looked under the bed. For a moment, just a moment, I thought I saw something. A flicker of movement, 
a flash of what might have been a small, pale hand. And then I heard it, a whisper so faint I could barely make it out. Help me! I scrambled back, my heart pounding. Sarah was watching me, her eyes wide. You heard her, didn't you? She asked. I nodded, unable to speak. That night changed everything. I dove into research, digging through old hospital records, city archives, anything I could get my hands on. And slowly a story began to emerge. In the 1950s, when the hospital was first built, there was an accident. A little girl, the daughter of one of the nurses, had been playing hide and seek in the unfinished building. She hid in a small space in what would become room 302, a space that was sealed up during construction. By the time anyone realized she was missing, it was too late. The official story was that she had run away, but the whispers among the older staff told a different tale of scratching sounds in the walls, of a child's cries echoing through the halls at night. I brought my findings to the hospital administration. At first, they didn't want to hear it, but as the incidents in room 302 continued, they finally agreed to investigate. They opened up the walls of room 302, and there, in a space barely big enough for a child to fit, they found her, a small skeleton clutching a teddy bear preserved in the dry, sealed space for over 60 years. The hospital held a proper burial, Room 302 was renovated, the walls torn out and rebuilt. And since then, there have been no more reports of strange noises or whispers. But sometimes, late at night when the halls are quiet, I swear I can hear the faint sound of a child's laughter echoing through the hospital. I don't know if I believe in ghosts, but I do believe that there are things in this world that we can't explain. Story 2. Growing up in the small village of Millbrook, Nestled in the rolling hills of rural England, I always thought life would be predictable. Quiet farms, local pubs, and the occasional petty crime to keep our lone police constable busy. But the events that unfolded in the summer of 1987 changed everything I thought I knew about our sleepy little corner of the world. I was 17 that year, working part-time at the local pub, The Crooked Hare. It was there that I first heard the whispers about Constable James Hardwick and his unusual experiences. At first, I dismissed them as small-town gossip, the kind of tall tales that grow taller with each retelling. But as the summer wore on and more stories emerged, I couldn't help but wonder if there was something more to it all. It started with what we now call the incident on Foxglove Lane. Hardwick had been called out to a routine disturbance, nothing more than a noise complaint from old Mrs. Pemberton about her neighbor's dog. He should have been back within the hour, but when he didn't return and the station couldn't raise him on the radio, people started to worry. I remember that night clearly. The pub was buzzing with speculation. Where was Hardwick? Had there been an accident? It wasn't like him to disappear without a word. As the hours ticked by, the theories grew wilder. It wasn't until nearly midnight that we heard the roar of his patrol car coming down the high street. Hardwick stumbled into the pub looking like he'd seen a ghost. His uniform was disheveled, his eyes wide and unfocused. He made his way to the bar, ordered a double whiskey, and downed it in one gulp. Then in a voice barely above a whisper, he began to tell his story. He'd been driving back from Mrs. Pemberton's when he saw the lights. Not car lights, he insisted, but something different. Brilliant, pulsating orbs hovering just above the road. He'd stopped to investigate, thinking perhaps it was some kind of prank. The last thing he remembered was stepping out of his car. The next thing he knew, he was back behind the wheel, the car facing the opposite direction, and nearly three hours had passed. We might have dismissed it as a joke, or maybe too much of the cooking sherry at Mrs. Pemberton's, if it weren't for two things. First, the strange iridescent residue found on Hardwick's uniform. The lab boys in the city couldn't identify it, said it didn't match any known substance, and second, the confirmation from the station that Hardwick's radio had gone completely silent for those missing hours. Not just out of range, but as if it had ceased to exist entirely. That was just the beginning. Over the next few months, Hardwick seemed to become a magnet for the inexplicable. The strangest of these incidents happened about a month after the Foxglove Lane event. It was a typically dreary English summer night, rain coming down in sheets, when Farmer Giles called in a panic. His entire herd of cattle, some 30 head, had vanished without a trace. 
Hardwick and a couple of officers from the next town over responded to the call. I heard about it the next day from my mate Tommy, whose dad was one of the responding officers. According to Tommy, they arrived to find Giles in a right state, babbling about lights in the sky in a sound like the world's biggest vacuum cleaner. The gate to the field was still locked, and there wasn't a single hoof print in the muddy field. The officers split up to search the surrounding area. Hardwick took the road that loops around the back of Giles' property. What happened next? Well, that's where things get truly strange. Hardwick reported that he kept trying to drive the loop, but no matter how many times he went around, he always ended up back at the start of Giles' driveway. It was as if the road itself was playing tricks on him. This went on for hours, until suddenly, just as dawn was breaking, he found himself able to complete the circuit. When he got back to Giles' farm, he found the other officers in a state of confusion. The cows were back, all of them, standing in the field as if they'd never left. But here's the kicker. Despite the continuing rain and the mud-soaked field, the cows were completely dry, and there wasn't a single new hoof print to be seen. Giles swore up and down he hadn't seen or heard them return. The other officers confirmed that they'd driven past the field multiple times during the night, and it had been empty each time. It was as if the entire herd had simply materialized out of thin air. These incidents put Millbrook on the map, in a manner of speaking. We had journalists from the big papers coming down, ghost hunters, UFO enthusiasts, the works. Most of us tried to go about our lives as normal, but there was an undercurrent of unease that never quite went away. Every unexplained light in the sky, every odd noise in the night, set tongues wagging. But it was the case of Dmitry Volkov that really cemented Hardwick's reputation as a magnet for the paranormal. Volkov was a farmhand who'd come over from Eastern Europe to work the harvest season. Quiet bloke, kept to himself mostly. One day in late August, he simply vanished. One minute he was working in the fields, the next, gone. Search parties combed the area for days, but there wasn't a trace of him to be found. A week after his disappearance, Hardwick got a call from a coal yard in a town some 30 miles away. A body had been found. When Hardwick arrived, he found a scene that defied explanation. Volkov's body was at the top of a massive pile of coal. And I mean the very top. A place that would have been nearly impossible for someone to climb, let alone carry a body. But there he was, laid out as if he was sleeping. The coroner's report read like something out of a science fiction novel. Volkov's clothes were the same ones he'd been wearing when he disappeared, but they showed signs of having been removed and then put back on. His body was covered in strange burns, and there was that same unidentifiable residue they'd found on Hardwick after the Foxglove Lane incident. But the real kicker? According to the coroner, Volkov had been dead for less than an hour when he was found. No rigor mortis, no decomposition, as if he'd somehow been preserved for the week he was missing, only to die shortly before being dumped on that coal heap. The official explanation was a freak accident involving ball lightning, but that didn't account for the missing week, the strange substance on his body, or how he ended up atop that coal pile. And it certainly didn't explain why no one had seen him on the single road between Millbrook and the coal yard. Hardwick was never the same after that. He became withdrawn, jumpy. He'd flinch at sudden noises, and his eyes were always darting around, as if he was expecting something to leap out at him from the shadows. He took early retirement the following year and moved away. Last I heard, he was living somewhere up north, as far from Millbrook as he could get. Story 3 as a Marine Corps military police officer stationed at the Futen Ma Air Station, I thought I'd seen it all. Bar fights, smuggling attempts, the occasional overzealous tourist, it was all part of the job. But nothing in my training had prepared me for what I would witness during my tour in Japan from 2010 to 2012. It all started on a seemingly ordinary night in late 2010. I was on patrol with my partner, Mike Donnelly, a no-nonsense Boston native with a dry wit that helped the long nights pass more quickly. We were cruising along the perimeter of the air station, the rhythmic hum of our squad car's engine occasionally broken by bursts of chatter from the radio. It was around 0230 hours when the radio crackled to life with an unusual message. Uh, 
Any units seeing the light over the water south? Mike and I exchanged glances. We both knew there were no scheduled flights that night, and the southern tip of the island, where our station was located, wasn't exactly a hotbed of nocturnal activity. Want to check it out? Mike asked, already reaching for the radio to respond. I nodded, a mix of curiosity and apprehension building in my gut. Yeah, let's do it. We weren't the only ones intrigued by the call. As we pulled up to the airfield, I saw two other patrol cars already parked, their occupants standing outside, eyes fixed on the horizon. And then I saw it. Hovering over the inky blackness of the Pacific was a light, unlike anything I'd ever seen before. It pulsed slowly, rhythmically, as if it were breathing. The light was too steady to be a star, too large and low to be a satellite. What the hell is that? I muttered, more to myself than anyone else. Sergeant Rodriguez, a veteran of multiple tours and not a man easily rattled, shook his head slowly. I've got no idea, Reeves, but I don't like it. We stood there, a group of trained Marines rendered speechless by a glowing orb in the sky. Someone suggested it might be a star, but deep down, we all knew better. Hey, dispatch, Rodriguez called into his radio. Can you get traffic control to zoom in on this thing with their cameras? A few tense minutes passed before the reply came. Affirmative. Traffic control has a visual. They're saying, they're saying the object appears to be moving slowly, heading southeast. A collective shiver ran through our group. To the naked eye, the light appeared stationary, but the high-powered cameras told a different story. Whatever this thing was, it was on the move. For the next hour, we watched in silent awe as the light continued its slow dance across the sky. Theories were tossed around, everything from experimental aircraft to elaborate pranks, but none of them felt right. There was something about the way it moved, the way it seemed to pulse with an inner life that defied conventional explanation. As dawn began to break, casting the first hints of pink and orange across the horizon, the light faded away as if it had never been there at all. We returned to our patrols, each lost in our own thoughts about what we had witnessed. I thought that would be the end of it, a strange but isolated incident to be filed away and eventually forgotten. I was wrong. Over the next few months, reports of similar lights began to trickle in. Most were easily explained away. Satellites, weather balloons, the occasional drone. But a few stood out, matching the description of what we had seen that night. Then came March 11, 2011, a date etched into the memory of everyone who was in Japan at the time. The Great East Japan earthquake struck, triggering a devastating tsunami and the Fukushima Daiichi nuclear disaster. In the chaos and tragedy that followed, thoughts of mysterious lights were pushed to the back of my mind. But as the weeks passed and a semblance of normalcy returned to our corner of Japan, something strange began to happen. The sightings increased. It was about a month after the earthquake when I had my second encounter. I was on a solo run along the seawall, a route I'd taken countless times before. The sun was setting, painting the sky in brilliant shades of orange and purple. As I paused to catch my breath, leaning against the weathered concrete of the wall, I saw it. A light, similar to the one we'd seen months before, darted across the sky. It moved with impossible speed and agility, weaving in and out of the clouds before disappearing in the blink of an eye. My heart raced, and not from the exertion of the run. This time, I knew it wasn't a figment of my imagination. This was real, and it was happening again. Over the next year, the sightings became a topic of hushed conversation among the Marines on base. Some spoke of lights diving into the ocean, others of strange formations moving in perfect synchronization across the night sky. Each story was met with a mix of skepticism and wonder, but as the reports mounted, it became harder to dismiss them as mere coincidence or misidentification. One night, about six months before the end of my tour, I was on patrol with a rookie named Thompson. We were parked on a bluff overlooking the ocean, taking a brief respite from the monotony of our rounds. Hey, Reeves, Thompson said, his voice unusually hesitant. Can I ask you something? I nodded, sensing the seriousness in his tone. Have you ever seen anything weird out here, like in the sky? I considered my answer carefully. Despite the increasing frequency of the sightings, there was still an unspoken rule about discussing them openly. Career military men didn't go around spreading stories about UFOs, not if they wanted to be taken seriously. 
But looking at Thompson's earnest face, I decided to take a chance. Yeah, Thompson, I have. What followed was a conversation that lasted well into the night. Thompson had seen something the week before, a formation of lights that moved in ways that defied the laws of physics as we understood them. As he spoke, I could see the relief in his eyes at finally being able to share his experience with someone who wouldn't dismiss it outright. As our discussion wound down, Thompson asked the question that had been nagging at all of us who had witnessed these phenomena. What do you think they are, Reeves? I sighed, looking out over the dark expanse of the Pacific. Honestly, I don't know, but I think they're trying to tell us something. Like what? That we're not alone. That there's more out there than we can possibly imagine. And maybe, maybe that we need to start paying attention. The remainder of my tour passed without further incident, at least for me personally. But the stories continued to circulate, each one adding to the growing legend of the Okinawa Lights. As I prepared to leave Japan in 2012, I took one last run along the seawall. The sun was setting, just as it had been on that day over a year ago, when I'd seen the light darting through the clouds. I half expected, half hoped, to see something, one last confirmation of the extraordinary events I'd witnessed. But the sky remained stubbornly ordinary, painted in the familiar hues of an Okinawan sunset. As I stood there, watching the last rays of sunlight disappear below the horizon. I realized that maybe this was the final message. The lights, whatever they were, had shown us a glimpse of something beyond our understanding. They had challenged our perceptions, sparked our imaginations, and perhaps most importantly, reminded us of how much we still have to learn about the universe around us. I left Okinawa with more questions than answers, but also with a profound sense of wonder. In the years since, I've often found myself looking up at the night sky, searching for a hint of that pulsing light I first saw on that fateful night in 2010. I haven't seen it again, but I know it's out there, somewhere beyond the veil of our limited perception, and I know that someday, somehow, we'll understand what it was trying to tell us. Until then, the mystery of the Okinawa lights remains, a reminder that in this vast universe, there are still echoes of light waiting to be discovered. Story four. I've been working as a night security guard at the Oak Ridge Apartments for about two years now. It's usually a pretty quiet gig, mostly just making sure nobody's throwing wild parties or messing with the amenities after hours. But there's one night I can't shake from my memory, no matter how hard I try. It was a chilly October night, maybe three or four months ago. I was doing my usual rounds, which always ended with a check of the rooftop pool area. Management's really strict about that pool. It's supposed to be closed and locked up tight after 10 p.m., no exceptions. Anyway, I was heading up the stairwell to the roof around 2 a.m. It was cold as hell that night, so I was taking my time, trying to stay warm in the stairwell before I had to step out into the wind. That's when I heard it, laughter. At first, I didn't think much of it. People in the building throw parties all the time, and sound carries weird at night. But as I listened, the laughter got louder and louder. It wasn't just a chuckle or a giggle. This was full-on, gasping-for-air cackling. The kind of laughter that makes you wonder if the person doing it is okay. I paused on the stairs, trying to figure out where it was coming from. It didn't sound close enough to be the pool, but it was definitely coming from above me. As I stood there listening, the laughter suddenly cut off and was replaced by shrieking. Now I've heard all kinds of noises in this job. Arguments, parties, you name it. But this shrieking, it made the hair on the back of my neck stand up. It wasn't scared shrieking or angry shrieking. It was just inhuman. I took a deep breath and pushed open the door to the roof. The shrieking stopped as soon as I stepped outside. The rooftop was pitch black. The lights around the pool were off and clouds were covering the moon. I pulled out my flashlight and started sweeping it around, trying to spot whoever was making the noise. That's when I noticed something weird. There were footprints on the roof, bare footprints, like someone had been walking around up here with no shoes on. But here's the thing. These footprints were dirtier than the roof itself. It was like someone had stepped in mud and then walked across the clean rooftop. I followed the prints with my flashlight. They were strange. No heel marks, just the ball and toes of the foot. Like whoever made them had been tiptoeing around. 
The prince led right up to the edge of the roof, then just stopped. I want to be clear here. The roof of this building is only accessible through the stairwell I came up. The door is always locked, and I had the only key. To get up here any other way, you'd have to scale a 12-foot concrete wall in the dark, in the cold. As I stood there trying to make sense of what I was seeing, I heard the laughter again. This time it was right behind me. I spun around, heart pounding, but there was nothing there. Just more of those weird footprints leading back towards the pool area. I followed them, my hands shaking as I held the flashlight. The prints led right up to the pool's edge and then vanished. I swept my light across the water, half expecting to see a body floating there. But the pool was empty and still, like a sheet of black glass in the darkness. That's when I saw it. A ripple in the water, right in the center of the pool. Just one ripple, spreading out in a perfect circle, like something had just dropped into the water. I don't mind admitting I ran. I bolted back to the stairwell and didn't stop until I was back in the security office. Door locked behind me. I spent the rest of my shift watching the security cameras, but they didn't show a thing. No one on the roof, no one in the pool. Just empty darkness. When morning came, I went back up to check. The footprints were gone. The pool was undisturbed. If I hadn't taken a picture of those footprints with my phone, I might have convinced myself I imagined the whole thing. I've been back up to that roof every night since then, but I've never seen or heard anything like that again. Sometimes on really quiet nights, I think I can hear faint laughter on the wind. But I tell myself it's just my imagination. The thing is, I looked into the history of this building after that night. Turns out about 10 years ago, before the building was renovated, a young woman fell from the roof. The official report said it was an accident. She'd been drinking, lost her balance, but there were rumors that she'd been pushed or that she jumped. They say she was a dancer, that she loved to dance in high places. Some of the longtime residents swear they've seen her sometimes, dancing on the edge of the roof in the moonlight. I don't know if I believe in ghosts. I don't know if what I saw that night was a spirit or a prankster or just my mind playing tricks on me. But I do know one thing. Every time I go up to that roof now, I make sure to announce myself. I've thought about quitting this job, finding somewhere else to work, but something keeps me here. Maybe it's curiosity. Maybe it's a sense of duty. Or maybe, just maybe, it's the hope that one day I'll solve the mystery of the midnight dancer on the roof. Story 5. I used to work a security guard at Millbrook Flats. It's an old apartment building that used to be a poorhouse back in the 1800s. It all started in late October. We began getting calls about fire alarms going off in the middle of the night. At first, we thought it was just faulty wiring or maybe some pranksters. But then it kept happening. Night after night, always between 2 and 4 a.m. The weirdest part? Every time we'd show up, the residents would be huddled outside, refusing to go back in. They'd tell us they could hear a woman crying inside. Some of them thought it was a homeless person who'd snuck in. Others said it was a crazy tenant, but no one ever found anyone. After about a week of this, my partner Jake and I decided to do a thorough sweep of the building. We arrived around 2.30 a.m., right after another alarm. The residents were all outside looking scared and annoyed. One old lady grabbed my arm as we walked past. Be careful in there, she whispered. It's not natural what's happening. Jake just rolled his eyes, but I felt a chill run down my spine. We entered the lobby, and immediately I could hear it, a faint sobbing sound echoing through the stairwell. Jake heard it too. We looked at each other, then started climbing. The crying got louder as we went up. By the third floor, it sounded like it was coming from just around the corner. My heart was pounding. I was sure we were about to find some poor woman huddled on the stairs. We turned the corner and nothing. The stairwell was empty, but the crying didn't stop. It was loud now, almost deafening, and it seemed to be coming from behind us. We spun around, and I swear the sound was coming from the top step of the stairs we'd just climbed, but there was no one there, just empty space. I don't mind admitting I nearly pissed myself right then and there. Jake's face had gone white. We stood there for a good minute, just staring at that empty step while the crying echoed around us. Finally, Jake snapped out of it. Let's get the hell out of here, he said. I didn't need telling twice. We practically ran down the stairs and out of the building. 
Outside, the residents were waiting. Did you find her? Someone asked. We just shook our heads and got in our car. I thought that would be the end of it. Maybe it was some kind of mass hallucination or something, but it kept happening. Every few nights, the alarms would go off and we'd get called out. Sometimes we'd hear the crying, sometimes we wouldn't, but it was always the same story from the residents, a woman sobbing in the stairwell. About a month after it started, I was working a night shift alone. Jake had called in sick. Around 3 a.m., I got the call about Millbrook Flats again. I didn't want to go in alone, but it was my job. The residents were outside as usual. I took a deep breath and went in. The building was dead quiet at first. I climbed the stairs slowly, my flashlight beam bouncing off the walls. When I reached the third floor landing, I heard it, that same soft crying. My hands were shaking so bad I could barely hold the flashlight. The crying got louder as I climbed. When I reached the fourth floor, it sounded like it was right next to me. I turned expecting to see nothing like before, but this time there was something there, a figure barely visible in the dim light. It looked like a woman in an old fashioned dress, her face hidden in her hands as she sobbed. I opened my mouth to say something, but no sound came out. Slowly the figure lowered her hands, her face. God, I'll never forget it. It was pale as death with hollow black eyes that seemed to stare right through me. Her mouth opened in a silent scream. I don't remember running out of the building. The next thing I knew, I was in my car, driving home as fast as I could. I quit my job the next day. Thanks for watching. Don't leave before leaving a like to this video. Also hit the subscribe button to support my work. And as always, have a horrific nightmare, my dear.